Okay. Well, thanks for coming. This is nice and uh, intimate uh, gathering. Um, it's, uh, the format of that's, this is just a, a walk and talk, so it is quite informal, but a good opportunity to talk about some of the images and how the project came about and the more uh, eager amongst you can ask more technical questions about photography, but not too many. <laughs> Just kidding. So uh, this, uh, we, I guess we worked with Larry on this to bring this back to public awareness project that was done in the 1970s, an uh, important period of time when what is called the Clydeside was one of the most industrialised areas of Europe, as the text panel describes here, at a time when it was just on the cusp of industrial decline. Uh, so it's a very significant uh, social and photographic record, probably the most in-depth and comprehensive in terms of one body of work that I've ever seen. And it's been fantastic to bring this back to the public and have it on the gallery walls because it's struck so many chords amongst people about uh, you know, the present day condition, the comparisons that people can make between then and now. And interestingly, it doesn't feel that far away, a lot of the, a lot of the things that are happening within these images. But uh, we'll maybe just start with one image here, which is this one here, Larry. And this guy is called Ozzy, and this is in Black Hill, uh, a housing estate in the east end of Glasgow quite near Parkhead, near Barlinny. And there's a connection between this guy um, and Edwin Morgan. What's, how did, what's the connection? I first uh, came to Glasgow after I had immigrated from New York maybe three years before. Uh, in the very early 70s, I had an assignment from a book publisher to photograph a few poets, and one of them was Edwin Morgan. And I arrived in Glasgow not really knowing where on the planet I was, and that happened. And that was the start of a relationship, not so much with Morgan and me, although we remained in contact for years later. Uh, I'd stay in his flat sometimes and so on when he lived out the Great Western Road in Glasgow. And um, he just, I don't know what it was, maybe he appreciated my almost instantaneous affection for Glasgow, maybe because he loved Glasgow. He never, from time to time, he lived, sojourned in other places, but he's always lived in Glasgow. And uh, we spent several weeks, almost two months together, and he was just taking me around and showing me his Glasgow. And so that was my introduction. And what was so pertinent for me as a recent immigrant is that it gave me an insight into New York. I mean, I was always inculcated with this sort of sense that New York was an English culture-based city, uh, but that was a lie. It was actually Scots-Irish. The, the music that you hear in the streets, if you know what I mean, inverted commas all over the place, you know, but it, that, the, those were the roots, and it gave me an understanding. As a new immigrant, it gave me an understanding of my you know, cultural background that actually I have no relatives that I'm aware of, ancestors who were Scottish or Irish. I doubt it, but I'm not, you know, maybe, <laughs> who knows. But um, it certainly uh, gave me an insight into the roots of my culture as a New Yorker. And this was, it's no longer years ago, now it's already decades ago that this happened, but, uh, I spent, after that, I finished the, the contract with the publisher and uh, the book was published and all that and I moved on and what does he do. But um, I spent the next period, almost two years, 
trying to organize my life to go back to Glasgow. Um, but that's how much preceded the Clyde side. This was the uh, first series. one. This, 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 this was, was actually the, made, yeah. this photograph was made before I had any idea about doing a project on the Clyde. Uh, I met him, well, he met me with two of his friends. I was walking through George Square, it must have been two in the morning or something. And uh, these three guys came over to me and asked me for a match, and I just laughed. I said, well, if you take all my stuff off me, I have nothing, you know. As if not, the four of us weren't naive, were naive, you know, we knew exactly what was going on. Anyway, they laughed, we sat down and we spoke until, it must have been summertime, because it, the sun came up very early, you know, and in the middle of the night. And uh, he invited me to his house in Black Hill. And I spent, I don't know, a couple of months with his family. Not every day, but on and off. I was concerned with the family. And we became friends and we kept in touch for a while afterwards, but that dissipated. I don't know where he is now. But... Um, his block of flats, uh, his part of Black Hill Estate, was just right up against Balini Prison. And it was hilarious, and they thought so too. But every evening, the family of the prisoners, and they were all going through the revolving doors, you know, in and out, in and out. It was their second home. In fact, one of the people on the estate once described it as his holiday time. And that was just what they did, you know, and they would shout, each other, hey, Jimmy, and all this sort of stuff would go on. And I was just in stitches, and I just kept saying, well, I'm here as a photographer, damn it. But, you know, it was hilarious. Yeah. It's absolutely, I mean, Jimmy uh, Conley. Jimmy Conley. Billy Conley had nothing on these people. You know, all, Joyce, James Joyce was once asked, how does he get his dialogue down? And he said he simply listens and writes it down what people say. <laughs> and they call it fiction, but yeah. it's not. It's document, you know, and that's true here too. And it's just, it was quite extraordinary. Yeah. So you kind of fell in love with the place, didn't you? You had to come back and do yeah. another project. That's right. And the project was about people at work. One of the things that, you know, you feel things. And I was young. I mean, I wasn't... You know, I was in my mid-twenties already when I was doing this. But, you know, already I was feeling things that are true today. Now I'm able to use words to express it. You know, but you live with something ticking over inside you somehow. And then all of a sudden something happens and you begin to express it in words. And that's imperative to do. Because music and other art forms, they're not basic to human Community. It's language that is the essential key. And if you don't use, if you can't use words, you really don't understand it to the extent that you can use it. You must begin to express the emotion in words somehow, your own words or whatever, other people's words, but you must use language. And this happened with me that I was feeling these things. I mean, since I was that high, I was feeling stuff. You know, and I was in the anti-Vietnam War movement, and I came here about a week before a warrant was issued for my arrest. And when I said goodbye to my family, we had to meet on a street corner. It, was, it wasn't heavy, you know. It was just, I was sublime. I was doing exactly what I wanted to do, and I was right. And I wasn't alone. There were tens of th millions of people, you know, doing the same thing. And I came to Britain for various reasons, but 200,000 people just crossed dirt roads into Canada. And, you know, it was a... That time is happening now, but what I began to articulate was that this whole sense, and you saw this again in the recent general election with uh, Corbyn supporters, that you know, I, I'm not necessarily a supporter of Corbyn, that's not the point I'm making, but what happened during that election was that people began to have a sense that they were no longer the objects, but became the subjects of change. We saw that in the streets yesterday in London, the demonstration over the fire in, 
in North Kensington, in, no in West London. You know, that uh, there was this, and I've always felt this, you know, I want to be part of the change, you know, I want to take part in my world. I don't want to be on the periphery of it. And I have these discussions with painters and poets and photographers and filmmakers all the time. You know, I say, I went to an exhibition, a student exhibition, the other night in London, at the University of East London, and I was walking around with a couple of the students, MA students, it was a master's show. And we went in a couple of the rooms and I kept asking, you know, well, why did you do this? You know, if, if someone has to ask that question, there's something wrong. There's something, not wrong, incomplete. You know, I'm not looking for friendships, I'm looking for communication. And are you saying that photography provided that Absolutely. method of communication for you? I went to... And in terms of your political beliefs, did uh, photography align with that? In terms of social commentary? I think so. I mean, I went through art school uh, at the Art Students League in New York and the uh, New School for Social Research and... I, went, I studied sculpture and I got a grant to go to Rome and, you know, I was, I was really, I loved sculpture, but I was a stinking sculptor. You know, I would stand next to the student and within two seconds they were doing that I would stand back and take me four hours, you know, and then not do it. I always felt inferior to, not all the students, of course not, but they were there, some there that I just felt that I could never be what they're doing. And this took its toll, and then I borrowed a friend's camera, a photographer, a budding photographer. We were very young, we were 20, 21 years old. And um, I used to borrow his camera on the weekend, and uh, right away, you know, I was selling stuff. And this is what I needed, <laughs> you know. And I've always felt, you know, that I don't see photographs of bodies of work. You know, I see individual photographs all the time that I really like. But as a body of work, I don't know of a photographer that uh, I don't feel certainly equal, but mostly superior in my own work. And this is a personal thing. I mean, that's, it's hard to be an artist. It really is. Yeah. Because you expose yourself and you have to defend yourself. And it's, it's not sufficient for me to say, well, art also has to have a bit of magic. It needs that too. It needs to be aesthetic and all of that. But you have to be, it has to be about something. So you lived in uh, London. You, you worked in various jobs, didn't you? You were a laborer. Yeah, in the early 80s, I reached a point when I just didn't you know, feel that I was doing anything. And um, I stopped photographing. I got a job uh, as a guard train driver on the underground trains in London. And then I, I did some welding as an art student, but I retrained. I got basic qualification and I went up to Sheffield and I worked at uh, big steelworks, forge masters and, and uh, various other st uh, welding uh, jobs, fettling jobs, welding jobs in steel. And I did that for 12 years. And I never sold my cameras. Maybe I should have. <laughs> I never did. I wrapped them up in rags and put them in a camera bag and all that. And for 12 years I didn't touch them. Not even personal pictures of people or friends or family. Or and then I worked my way through that. And in the early, about 1991, I started shooting again. And, um, which is now a long time ago, you know, but you've got to go with what you are. You know, I, I don't have any sort of notion of what's right and wrong. I can just tell you what motivates me. Now, it's important to note that, that you are a working photographer, though this work is made in the 70s. It's very similar to some recent work that you've been doing in Cuba, working with the unions. We can maybe come back to that once we've had a little bit of a walk round, and then there was Waged London, which I think is worth talking about. Uh, but just going back to some of the 
the images uh, here. I mean, this section is all Renfrewshire, basically Paisley and Renfrewshire. And although we had this exhibition on at street level, I didn't quite realise there were so many from Renfrewshire when it was, you know, the, the car industry and, and Hillington. Hillington and Linwood. Uh, it was huge at the time, and obviously the mills as well. That's somebody working in Coates Mill. That, um, yeah, yeah, mill. yeah, yeah. This one's an interesting one, though, because you mentioned the election there in relation to we have a Conservative government, but this is the, the last day of full-time working and the start of what was called the three-day week. You remember that? Mm. Yeah, I yeah. remember that. I yeah. I was working in banking at the time and we, we kept getting power strikes and yeah. everything went down. And yeah. yeah, and that was imposed by the Heath government, wasn't it? The three-day week in order to con conserve energy. There had been a lot of, kind of industrial disputes leading up to that, hadn't there been? And yeah. At a time when the National Union of Mine Workers was a huge industrial force. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the details of it I'm not too clear about, but there's, a, there's actually a very good Wikipedia entry on the three-day week here, which is when, worth looking at. When Malcolm first approached me to have an exhibition about, what, more than two years ago now? It's, Could have been. Must be, yeah. Um, at um, at uh, street level in Glasgow. I thought, this is weird. I mean, I did this stuff in the mid-70s, and here a, a man wants to hang it as if it was new stuff. Because from the very start, I think I said something like, this is not about nostalgia. It's not about anything to do with the... When I was shooting this, I had no idea that it was going to hang 40 odd years later. It opened up at what was then the Third Eye Center, mm -hmm. and it was very successful. Uh, housing estate schemes from around Glasgow hired mini coaches. One had a coach, and local people came down and saw their families in these photographs. Because for me to get into these situations, I had to do a lot of, well, I, I do a lot of talking, as you might have guessed, but you know, I spoke to people and I asked them, what do you want other people to know about you? And after a period of time, they took that question seriously. And they said, you know, we don't want to be involved. And I said, well, I regret that, but I went on to another. You know, all of these people allowed me into their lives, you know, because somehow people were convinced that I didn't see them as objects. You know, I, they're people, human beings, you know, walking around on their knees. Was it one of the uh, Irish uh, nationalists and Republicans in the uprising in seven, 1917 said something like, you know, the, the English look so big because we're on our knees, or that's a paraphrase, but that's something like that. And it's true. You know, and I use that because I'm there with people. It's, they're not objects, you know, and I... I love <laughs> the fact that you work for Edmund Morgan and things. And I don't know how your lungs survived, but there you go. He changed more pretty much um, and things. So, But I, there's a very strong connection for me between poetry and, and photography. And That's I think with a lot of the key main photographers, yeah. Uh, that expression which captures things in words and the, the, the capturing it in image is, is, is closely aligned in the humanity yeah. of that, yeah. I think, too. Yeah. The other two photographers that Larry uh, was commissioned to uh, capture was Seamus Heaney right. and uh, Norman McCaig. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that three book. Of my favourite people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a fantastic book, that. Yeah. Seven Modern Poets on Penguin. You can sometimes right. pick it up on Amazon and eBay. Let's, uh, let's, I'll, I'll move that chair for you, Jane, when you... So maybe if we just dwell here for a little while, we've got an image of the Red Road Flats here, which at the time of their construction were the highest uh, tower blocks in Europe at the time, in the 60s, which are a model of utopian architecture. And that's a couple of ladies in the lift there. What, what do you recall of your, of your visits? Uh, I spent probably six or seven months photographing the Red Road Flats. Yep. 
And I say that amount of time, it doesn't mean I was there every day, you know, but I was always thinking of ways, excuses, uh, to not do something else so that I could go back there. Uh, the asset that I've got is time. Um, I always, time is imperative in the way I work. And, you know, I get into people's homes, you know, and for instance, I, how do I deal as a photographer with the problem of a lift? I went up to the top floor many times, but I went up to the top floor and it would take me almost 40 minutes to get down to street level. There were two lifts stopping at the floors, maybe one was broken, uh, ambulance stretches had to be, coffins had to be stood up in the, because the lift wasn't big enough. Uh, whoever designed those really didn't think about the humanity that had to live in them. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, they might have been great, you know, styrofoam models, you know, looking down at them as if you were an eagle. But, you know, no sense of what it was like to live there. That, you know, so I photographed this utter dejection getting into a lift. And actually, I think they were going up, not down. But, you know, I, I have tons of photographs of bad drainage on street level that people had to walk around puddles that didn't drain away after the rain. Uh, the, uh, the, there was dampness on the top floors from the walls, obviously not from the ground. And they weren't very old, these flats at this time. No, I mean, this was in the mid-70s and they were built in the 60s. Yeah. I mean, it was just... Cold. Same here, this, this is the new Gorbals. How do you photograph, a, you know, buildings that don't relate to the people so, you know, you don't, there's a doll in front of the people's faces, you know. I mean, that's just my metaphor. You know, this, this woman could not put that lift, that uh, pram in the lift. Yeah. It didn't fit. She looks yeah. so fed up. <laughs> yes. she? I mean, you like could not make there. this up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you about these pictures? How much direction are you giving the people that you're photographing? Like, are you saying, sit there and look sad? Or are you following them about their daily life? Or how is it working? I was once photographing in Birmingham. And I went to a uh, uh, sickle cell uh, in uh, a lot of people of African descent for a genetic reason. I don't know why, but they suffer from that. That's a, well, I don't remember the full name of it, sickle but sickle cell. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And I went to a clinic that dealt specifically with that. And there was a glass in the middle of the table full of water. And the person I was with moved it. And I said, what are you doing? And I put the glass back the way it was when I walked into the room. And this little anecdote is that I don't touch a thing. I don't own any sort of flash or synthetic light. It's all available light. I don't move a thing. I don't tell people, can you stand there, please? Uh, there were a couple of photographers here last night, and they kept telling me, stand here, look that way. That's an anathema to the way I work. I mean, I cooperated because that's what I'm here, you know. But I don't work that way. I don't tell people a thing. And if I have a problem in, de in photographing closeness or light or backlight or too much sun, whatever it is, I will move myself. And nothing in front, I don't move a thing. I don't even crouch. I always photograph my own height. Now, this doesn't mean for a second that some really good photographs have been made with the photographers kneeling or standing on lad, I don't know. But I don't do that. It's just a very personal way of working. There would have been a conversation happening. You know, someone doesn't just let you into their home. Yeah, there's, sure. a, there's a situation of trust, you know, so like, get the, in the way that, I mean, it isn't staged, but she isn't disagreeing with the fact that you're taking photographs of her, and 
that situation, yeah, which is really interesting. And if yeah. you think about the women and the children in the shelter here, yeah. because they've suffered domestic abuse, I mean, you know, that's very trusting for people to let you see them at a really low point in That took place. a long time to arrange. Mm. And they picked me up on a street corner, and they said, either you, we blindfold you, or you promise not to <laughs> disclose yeah. the address. Yeah. And I said, I promise, you know. But there's this level of trust. You know, I mean, these women are on the run. That's shocking. Uh, from men who are after, they would be killed, some of them. You know, with children. I mean, it's horrible. But these places used to have the unfortunate description or name of uh, homes for battered women, didn't they? That's the only caption that I changed from the original captions. Because, in fact, it was my daughter who uh, said, you know, that's dated. You got to, you know, it, it's not accurate anymore. And I phoned the Interval Home in Glasgow when I was in London. And I asked, I explained the situation I was having. And they said, uh, domestic abuse is the phrase we use now. So I changed it. And I think I was right to change it. I mean. In today's uh, Herald, by the way, there's in the magazine, there are some photographs of uh, Anan, who is a photographer who documented, uh, that's my word, I don't know if he would call it documents, but anyway, he photographed Glasgow in the 19th century. And uh, after, when this first opened at the Third Eye, it toured around a bit, and I lost contact with it and I got a uh, phone call from a uh, gallery in Kendall and they wanted to put an exhibition with my stuff against Anand's and I said do what you want to do but you know it's an interesting juxtaposition it's, I mean, yeah that is interesting I mean Anand's a, as a classic example of yeah. documenting a right. time and a place That's right. and interestingly enough he was commissioned by that's right. Glasgow Corporation or whatever it was called to make a record of our city at this point in time. Because it's so dreadful and these buildings are about to go, yeah. whereas these are the things that the city's fathers sort of thought were ideal for the <laughs> masses, you know. But you're yeah. pointing out, mm, not really such a move on no. from the slums of, you know, in the city. You couldn't open the windows. Mm-hmm. They, I mean, it was a hurricane out, out there. Mm. You just, it was horrible. The wind. That's it. I so obviously, over. for people like me who remember it, there's a sense of posterity to it. But I yeah. think more than that, there's the message which is there, which is which transcends that um, that these the, these times, and it, obviously the way of seeing, which is um, yeah. of you know. Yeah. So we learn ways of seeing, and the ways of seeing are the you know are the the things which make us photographers or just. You know, like there's, no, there's so many images taken every minute these days, more the, in the last year than in many years before. So people take loads of images, but there's a difference between that and the the engagement, the relationship, and you know what's happening. That's so right. That's, that's right. why I think they're they're amazing because they speak to me. Yeah. And it's about the identity of Glasgow, which. Yeah. I've lived in Paisley now for 17 years, so um, I'm quite strongly Paisley, but I lived in Glasgow for yeah. and worked in this. And so it speaks to me about the identity of the city, which is still there, still in the people. You know, what makes Glasgow, you know, people make Glasgow was the, the phrase, and I think yeah. that's still true. A lot of these people are still alive, and, you know, and they're part of that, that city, which is, so that's... I think also it's imperative that somehow we need to become citizens of time. You know, internationalism is slightly easier. But, you know, a week is... is, These idiots say a week is a long time. (laughs) They live in some sort of world that I don't inhabit at all. My mother was born in a village on the Tennessee-Virginia border in the United States. And as a little girl, she sat on the knee of Confederate soldiers who were elderly, but they fought in the Confederate in the Civil War. And that's my mother, and that's what I heard on her knee, stories about the she hated the South. She went to New York when she got married and she always lived. 
when I was a kid, people used to mock her accent. She never lost her southern accent. But that's what time is. You know, it's, a week is not a long time. A century is not a long time in our collective experience. You know, and, well, she had to leave this little village because she never actually said this, but I understand from her brothers and that the clan burnt a cross on their front lawn because they were a liberal family. So the family decided, you know, they better go to a bigger city. And so they all migrated into Richmond where they could disappear more easily. In those days, Richmond was a small, a large town. Now it's about a million and a half people. But anyway, that's another story. But time is something that we have to come to terms with. Yeah. This collection of images is largely Hi. to do with unions and uh, workers' rights, a uh, bit of politics in this as well. So just This is an interesting one, this chap in here. This is the first issue of the Scottish Daily News, which was the first um, workers-run newspaper in Glasgow to compete with the other popular titles at the time. I don't know how long that run for, but that's a historical moment, that, that photograph there. Quite important. I don't remember how long it was. What that uh, newspaper did. We've got a student sit-in, the times when uh, students, students you, yeah, you used, used to have, have a sit-in, you know, I can remember <laughs> doing that at our school. And uh, also a really nice portrait here of this lady, Annie Stewart, 50th anniversary, general strike rally. But your empathy with people was also quite important because you worked as well. You were not somebody who was apart from anyone else, and that's that's makes the nuances of the of the project quite quite pointed for me. So can I ask a couple of technical questions? Are these thirty five mil shots? Are they right? I was w waiting for someone to no, get just, technical with no, me. Just, uh, I just thought they all had a similar pers kind of. I don't, it's all 35 millimeter. Oh, 35 it's millimeter. all HP5 Ilfid stock. Okay. Uh, I prefer Ilfid because yeah, it was, yeah. in those days they would give me money to use their stuff. Okay. And I just got into the habit. But Ilfid, plastic, the stock of which the emulsion is put, is thinner than the Kodak. I mean, I could get really eccentric about it, you know, yeah. but I just prefer it, subjectively. I love like, this. I mean, obviously, the foreground's out of focus, and this is not totally sharp, but it's got a feel. Um, and then here, because there's a slightly slower shutter speed, you get the movement of the, the page flicking. Do you so, know what reticulation means? Uh -huh, yes. You use digital, so I'm not sure. No, I used to use, used to uh, use film. Used to Reticulation film. is when you, uh, it can be caused by an abrupt change in temperature, mm -hmm. but also uh, developers tend to be alkaline and fixes to stabilize the film or paper tend to be uh, acidic, which chemically they're opposites. And if you mix them straight away, it has an effect either on the film or the paper, and it explodes your silver bromides. And you can, it looks like big drain, but actually it's called reticulation. Well, I just was developing some film, and a batch of film reticulates. Some of it doesn't happen all the time, just bad luck. Some of it, I printed it, mm -hmm. I didn't give it, it looked, it was a good picture. I don't care if it's out of focus. That's what I'm, um, exactly. I finally that's got to I'm your question. To, no, that's what I'm saying. You know, I don't, I don't no. give a damn. I really yeah. don't. Well, I mean, all this serendipity part of it is, I, I put myself in a situation. That doesn't mean I control every. That photograph at Butlins in air. That little kid is sticking his tongue out at the tiger. Well, I saw that in the dark room. I didn't see it when I was, I saw him looking down at the tiger. Uh -huh. And I, this kid's, you know, feeling really superior. 
I don't know what he's thinking. Anyway, he's sticking his tongue out, you know, and I didn't, and that's fine. I put myself in that situation, and that's what I applaud, that I was there, but I didn't see everything. Obviously, digital films, you know, people go click, 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 and they're taking lots and lots and lots of photographs. Obviously, the film stock, you know, you're more careful about how many images you take and certainly how many images you would actually, you know, develop. But, I mean, would you have would you have taken lots and lots and lots of shots for every shot that you get? Or I never make photographs when I'm shooting. I'm just getting a situation into mm -hmm. the camera mm -hmm. and the photograph is made through the editing. And yes. So there'd be lots of shots that you would have t then selected the one. And I might go through ten rolls, I might go right. through six frames. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'll feel that, well, I've got it in the camera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I choose what I photograph intellectually, that I want to say something about that sort of situation and so on. But, you know, I'm dealing in metaphors all the time. It's an emotional art form that I use in a sense. My intellect is there, but there also is something else that you need that you've got to talk about for years, and then all of a sudden it emerges with a lot of hindsight and so on, and all of that process goes on too. But I, these are metaphors. I mean, those two lads, you know, what are three inches high, four inches high? It's also two dimensions. There's a whole world around, and I have no relationship with filmmakers at all, aesthetically. I love film, but aesthetically, they're worlds apart because, you know, there's a whole world. There's, there's sound going. You can hear sometimes the mournful ships hooting or whatever, you know. Or Jimmy come home for lunch. You know, none of that is in the picture. I've stopped it. It's a metaphor, nothing else. It's a great one of Green Up though. No, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It just says so much about the place. You're asking about thirty five mil and uh, yeah, analogue and yeah. digital, but none of these had been digitized and it's only recently that we managed to talk Larry into letting us scan the original negs. It took a bit of persuading. And that's the first time they've been digitised <laughs> from the original negs on the Hasselblad scanner. Right. So that, that's, there's now an archive exists of this work. Uh, yeah. This image here of this uh, guy, ticket collector on uh, Glasgow Underground. Now, I'm glad to say I don't remember the Underground at that time, but then I was, I was quite young, probably never came to Glasgow that much from where I lived. But the, the technician who works here who put this exhibition up with Andrea remembers this guy. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Actually, my husband, he remembered him as well. Really? Mm -hmm. Really? Because he was distinctive. Yeah, yeah. He was apparently a collector of uh, diff knives. <laughs> Knives and, and ceremonial knives. Ceremonial yeah. knives, yes, yeah. yes. Mm. You're on the danger list now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wonder where he is, or if not, how many family. It would be interesting. A bit. This is what I get emails was. ever so often. Are you the Larry I used to know who went, you know? And I say, yeah. And then there's no reply. They're not really interested in developing that. <laughs> well, that's not true, because when we had the exhibition in Glasgow, there was another photographic journey that you undertook in Norway, in a remote part of Norway, small village, and you photographed people there. And some of that is up on your website. That is weird. But there was three people that you photographed who were that size as kids came to Larry's talk in Glasgow. And, and they were around for a couple of days. It was fantastic. We for some yeah, it was all the way up in the Norwegian Arctic. coming back together. Yeah. You know. It was weird. Now they're grandparents. And, and they're, I mean, it's just time. Photography is an extraordinary diary. It's so many other things too. But for me, you know, I, I've done a bit of traveling. And I, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, is, is a writer, journalist. And he, his flat is just 
full of mementos, spears from this island or masks from this country. I've got nothing. I've got one little thing that was given me years ago. It's all in the photographs. I don't need well, I all this. Quite, yeah, I think that's quite substantial. <laughs> I mean, but, but the father of the two brothers, he right. made or bought a boat. He, his he fishing trawler. His fishing trawler was named after Larry. Course, he sent me an email across the front of it. says, Larry. I mean... <laughs> So you, 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 you must have made an impression on somebody then, Larry, eh? <laughs> Can I ask, do you get commissions to do these projects then, or do you just go out and do your own thing and then hope that someone will take them on? Ninety-nine percent of my work is uh, not commissioned. The original, uh, not this show, I had a show in London, and I had no money. Couldn't print it. I didn't even know how to print. It was at the. It was my first exhibition, and I went to the yellow pages, and I phoned printers, and I found a printer, who I discovered, and he said, "Yeah, come down and we'll have a talk about it." I, it turned out that he was a fashion photographer's printer, all the big, you know, he's a wonderful printer, and he printed the exhibition for nothing, including the paper at night and uh, a few Saturdays. And the stuff, I'm still using his technique when I print. I mean, I saw stuff that I, it would take me 40 years to discover on my own, as that's what teaching's about. You know, this is just incredible. And that's how I've always, this original exhibition, I got money from Ilford. Not only film and, and paper, but they gave me money. Uh, that stopped over the years. It's gone. They're back, and then it goes. And Leica gave me money. I've always used Leicas. That stopped a long time ago. Uh, I got a bursary from the English Arts Council. Their first, I think it's their first. It could have been the second bursary. And the director of photography, I don't know if it direct, but the person, the uh, British, it was the British Arts Council in those days. Uh, a man called uh, Barry Lane told me years later that there was a hell of an argument and they usually didn't go to a vote but it had to go to a vote for some reason. I know why but that's another anecdote. That's a common sight these days that people... Headscarf. Uh, yep, a woman working in a brick factory. What was that exhibition that was recent at the art school of the woman that did the zero tolerance campaign? That was Frankie Raffles. Frankie Raffles, yes. Yeah. That was a really extraordinary. I'm sure you would have enjoyed it, but it was a lot of uh, women in um, the Soviet Union, weren't there? Yeah. They were doing really, really heavy. They were, you know, strong women. They yeah. were amazing. That yeah. sort of reminds me of, I think, the headscarf and everything yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. The Glasgow women these days were tough as tough could be and things like because I worked with some of the street workers and the, the things like that. And like Gina, she had a, a right hook, she could floor a big guy. Yeah. <laughs> she was yeah. she was as tough as they come. And yeah. there was a lot of women in Glasgow in in these days who worked as hard as the men and were as tough as the men. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think there are many and of course like in the four corners of Glasgow, still here in Renfrewshire. In these poor communities, the woman runs the house. She does the money, she runs the house. And the men, the men come back from their job and they sit down and they're like mothers, you know, like their wives are like mums, you know, and they expect their dinner on the table. And, you know, it's still That's west right. of Scotland man, as they say. Yeah. So, it's, yeah. um, so these women uh, were amazing, yeah. still are. Well, I mean, during the war, women had to do everything, didn't Absolutely, they? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, those it lessons don't then, yeah. die yeah. out, yeah. even if you try to shove them back, you know, into the domestic sphere. Mm. Can I ask about rules of photography and how you feel about breaking them? So I don't know rules of photography, but for rules of telly. So I know this one and the general strike one and with that one, I would have had them in this side, so there's looking space. How do you feel? Because you often quite have them nearer towards the edge. As much as I'm intellectualising the way I work, I think art has to have a magical element. And that's so subjective. It has to look good. And to me, that picture looks good. <laughs> 
The space is as important as she is, as an image. You know, I'm not writing, I'm using a visual image. And I'm depending on all sorts of stuff that people bring to it. And sometimes it's okay, and sometimes it fails, but there has to be that magical element to it too. So you know. if the rules were there, you wouldn't have a light on the edge, and you would try and allow the space for the person to come in. But the strength of this picture, if you look at it, is if you have to, you would have a very strong image just on that side, and you'd also have a very strong image on that side. So you can actually take sections of that picture and you still have a strong a strength in the image, which is one of the, the ways you can tell a good picture is that you can actually sometimes take parts of it out and it's still strong. Yeah. And that's... Right. Sorry, I'm, I'm I mean, by really saying that, that yeah, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. I mean, but that, by saying that, yeah. you've just drew my attention to the shovel mm. and the sledgehammer. Yeah. Never meant, I never noticed the sledgehammer before, mm. but I notice it now. <laughs> there you go. That's that. So, uh, so that's why it doesn't matter. Um, and the the danger is that everybody learns two thirds, and everything's on the two thirds, or everybody tries to do photography to rules. And if you try to do photography to rules when you're taking pictures of people you then have to force them into situations and then you're not actually, you're not an observer anymore, you're starting to, right. to, to push people yeah. into positions. I want to say two things. One is that one of the problems, I'm active in my trade union, and one of the problems I have with the editors consistently is that they use photographs to illustrate text. Uh, he is a, you know, thousands of words about a demonstration or something. And then they'll have a big photograph illustrating the words. Now, I think it should be, you know, or working in more harmony. The other thing is that language is very, very difficult. I think, you know, we all have our history and we all bring to where we are at the moment predicated on a huge array of stuff. And, you know, how do you deal with that when you don't? You just do what you think is good. Well, however you define that. Aesthetically, intellectually, politically, whatever it is. And you just put it into the pot. Yeah. Well, we're probably going to have to wind yeah. up. Uh, it's been absolutely fascinating, but let's just mm -hmm. finish with this section here because it's quite important. Yes, and this is the this is the this is the pillar of of the Clyde side, isn't it? The shipbuilding. And uh, there was some talk last night amongst people that I noticed talking. You know, some of the um, less young people just talking about the 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 loss of these highly skilled trades that exist and to work in these jobs. I mean, it was an exceptionally skilled workforce, uh, wasn't it? And you, you, you had some comments to make up that. Like, what, what is that guy doing? The, uh, this is the bed plate in a car. It's about that big. Uh, this probably weighs, I don't know, near enough 50, 60 tons. Uh, it's the bed plate in which the crankshaft sits and it has to be absolutely true because in time if it's slightly off and I mean ten thousandth of an inch or mil or whatever in time it'll break that crankshaft which drives the propellers of the ship and this is a wire even a Leica couldn't really, because it's vibrating, because he's twitching it, and he's listening to with earphones to see the dead center of this, uh, of this bed. I mean, these people, I always think of people skilled like this as artisans. They're not actually, they transcend people with a trade, you know. I mean, I was never skilled in all the work that I did. I was always semi-skilled. Even as a welder, I was doing very perfunctory type of welds, you know, very repetitive. But never, you know, I, I wasn't even, I didn't approach some of the skills 
that people had that I worked alongside. And this man, you know, is an artisan. We marvel at glass blowers and, you know, silversmiths. So is he, you know, only he's dealing in tons and something ostensibly crude in appearance. But artisans, that's what they are. Can I ask a personal question? You were saying that you stopped um, photography for 13 years or so, didn't touch it before you decided to come back. So what made you think, OK, I'm not even touching a camera for 13 years? And then what was it that made you think now is the time to do it again? I, I can't answer. I don't know. Uh, and I'm not being facetious. You know, I, I just, I really, truly didn't, I didn't have a sojourn in not photographing, thinking I'll go back. I didn't photograph. I didn't sell my cameras. So in those 12 years when you were doing your train, train driving, would you be constantly looking out and going, that would make a great photo, or was it just... I'd never photograph where I were. Now I would give, you know, two pounds to get into that, you know. Never used it, never photographed. You know, I, I worked in a big uh, foundry, perhaps the second biggest foundry in Europe in those days, in Sheffield called Forge Masters. We used to cast castings, 200 tons. You know, unbelievable weight. And uh, never photographed it. You know, flame shooting, hellfire and damnation, that was it. You know, never photographed it. You were walking about Paisley this morning with your camera. I did, was. I was did out you, did you take any photographs? I fired the camera once. <laughs> That's because it's, it's probably got a fantastic photograph then. No. <laughs> Doesn't happen that way. Yeah. <laughs> it was one of the vintage cars, wasn't it? Did you find a Ford Capri? Because we were talking about Ford Capris last night, funnily enough. Thanks so much. <laughs> and it's been really nice to get to know yeah. you. I, I love meeting the people behind the images and things, so I really appreciate it. I'm sorry there weren't more people here for you, but it's well, been special there's, there's, for us. We're few in numbers, but you've been exceptionally uh, engaged as an yeah. audience, so thank you very much. That's the point. Yeah. <laughs> but I really, really value that, so thank you. Yeah, well, thanks for thank coming. You. Thank you. And uh, for all your observations. Thank you. Okay. May I give yeah. you a car? Yes, yeah, so please. please.